Greetings to you again in the beautiful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm Lauren Weiss from Grace Now Ministries. We're situated in South Africa in the city of Port Elizabeth, which is now known as Gavecha. It has received a new name. And uh, so it's more in line with our African culture. Now, um, I'm so glad you're here to join us for another Bible study. It's winter in South Africa, so thus I have my bulky jersey on today, uh, keeping myself nice and warm and excited to get into this Bible study with you. We're in Lesson 65, and I just want to recap on the last lesson, because it was in that lesson that we asked the question, why Paul says that we are saved by faith without works, but James says that it's necessary to show our faith by our works. So remember that James is concerned about the conduct and the work of the Hebrews in the ages to come, Remember, he's writing to the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad, according to James 1.1, 1, 1, and their faith is required to get them to endure during the tribulation to get them into the kingdom, because they are going to have to face challenges such as uh, rejecting the mark of the beast, such as moving, perhaps fleeing into the wilderness on the instruction that they will receive at that time. This all has to do with what events are going to happen after the rapture of the body of Christ. So after they have faith and confidence in the blood of Christ, this will be the remnant of Israel, the little flock, uh, those who come to believe during the seven-year tribulation. And once they, uh, they understand what the cross has accomplished for them, that Jesus Christ is a better alternative, a better sacrifice, a better promise, a better hope, and a better resurrection, the better covenant, etc., which things they will learn in studying the books of Hebrews through to Revelation, then their faith is expressed outwardly in bringing forth works necessary for Israel to go into the kingdom. So we understand that there are two different programs being dealt with with regard to this particular question. Uh, do go back to the previous lesson if you missed that, and you can catch up that information. But if we place these teachings on the timeline in the correct dispensation, then the question is easily resolved. Now, we talk about that, but what about grace believers? Is our faith really without works? So today as grace believers, we show our faith by no works for salvation but teaching that believing in the finished work cross work of the lord jesus alone is salvation his work not ours and sharing that with others so that they can also be saved so remember the gospel of grace does not accept any works for salvation and i'll remind you quickly of what we've covered in previous lessons our works only come after salvation as a fruit of being saved they are produced as a result of Christ living in us and through us. According to Galatians 20, 2 verse 20, Paul says, it's no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. And this labor in the Lord as a result of our salvation has an enormous eternal impact and consequence upon our lives and also those of those around us, especially and primarily our loved ones. We have a responsibility and an accountability to respond to the Lord working in us. Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God who which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So the Lord graciously gives us the heart and the desire to do good works. Titus 2.14 says, Who gave himself for us that he may redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a particular peculiar people, zealous of good works. So that zeal of works comes through us because his love constrains us to live a life for his glory, effective and fruitful by the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which we read about in Galatians 5, 22 to 23. But we must willingly choose to respond as workmen and vessels meet for the master's use. We'll read more about that in 2 Timothy 2, 19 to 24. So we desire and determine that we don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. The more we study the word of God, the more we can know and discern what is God's will for the details of our lives. We get on his program and begin to operate and execute his will when we operate in line with 
the grace dispensation. Paul says this is a reasonable service. Paul talks in Romans 12, 1 to 2, about being a living sacrifice. And he says it's a reasonable service in light of God's mercy to us and his gift of eternal life. If you know and understand what the Lord has done, his wonderful love and grace, surely that's that's going to motivate you, a grace motivation to to really want to get out and tell others about the Lord's love and the salvation plan he has for us. So we will be rewarded by the Lord and we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ one day to give an account of all the good and the bad done in the body whilst we were on earth. 2 Corinthians 5, 9 to 10 says, Wherefore we labor that, being present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So we will be accountable to the Lord for the things we've done that are good and the things that we've done that are bad. I do believe we will remember much of our earthly life at that point in time as we present ourselves before the Lord. The Lord will reward us in the eternal vocation that he has for us because he has an eternal job for us to do when we get into the heavenlies from what we understand as we read Paul's epistles. Remember that we are not punished for the bad we have done. It is brought up and set aside and burnt in that fire because the Lord Jesus was punished on our behalf. We covered this extensively in previous lessons, so if you haven't covered it, please go back uh, and uh, find out more because it's a really important uh, fact of our Christian living. And then Paul goes on to explain, talking about that labor, what is that labor? And really what it is, is being ambassadors for the Lord to share the grace gospel. In 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 19, as Christians, we get our commission from the Lord. And that is that all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and have given up to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed to us the word of reconciliation so love the Lord read his word to that you can renew that inner man daily and allow that word to work effectually in you let go of guilt and bondage, replace that with grace and liberty and rejoice in the wonderful life of being a saved sinner. And so our name is changed from sinner to saint, a saint being a holy one of God, one set aside in Christ. So remember, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. A Christian's labor and love we don't see necessarily the fruits of that because our work is unseen, because faith is an unseen activity. But we know that the Lord will use our lives for his glory. If you have a moment, go and read 1 Corinthians 15 verse 58. You will find it most encouraging. Now, as we move on our timeline, we're going to talk about Abraham again. Remember in the last lesson, we spoke about the dual justification by faith alone. Um, of Abraham that would apply to both the persons of circumcision, the Jews, and to the uncircumcision, who are the Gentiles and the nations. In other words, everyone who's not a Jew. Abraham is also a dual father of those who believe of both groups. We read about this in Romans 4, 11 to 12. He says, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of right, the righteousness of faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, the right, that righteousness might be imputed to them also, and the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. Remember the charts we used in the previous lesson and uh, how we showed God working with Abraham's faith before circumcision and again after circumcision. Now, there's another important fact that I, I think that you need to be aware of. And this is the reason is for your own clarity, but also because as Christians, you'll be speaking to other people, other members of the body of Christ, other believers. And this question is going to arise and you need to have a, a good understanding of what it is. 
And that is that although all people who trust God by faith are called the children of Abraham and have received that spiritual blessing because of faith, being the salvation we have in Christ, who is the seed of Abraham, it does not mean that the Gentiles are entitled to the physical and material blessings and to the position that God gave to the nation of Israel. It does not make Gentile believers or the nations spiritual Israel to take the place of Israel, which is taught by many mainline churches. Uh, it's called replacement theology, covenant theology, kingdom theology, supersessionism, meaning that we have superseded Israel, etc. There are a number of names for it. But the point is, remember, the Christian body of Christ does not replace Israel in any way. Because God still has a plan for Israel and there's a significant role where God is going to use Israel in the ages to come, in the future. But the body of Christ is a distinct group called out for a distinct purpose. As Paul explains, we are a new creation and we will one day reign in the heavenly places and not on earth in the eternal program. Paul tells us this. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, he says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And then in Galatians 6.15, he says, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. In Galatians 3.14, he speaks about that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the spirit through faith. So the distinction is very clear in scripture. If you can see the difference between the prophecy program, which was known since the world began, and the mystery program, which was kept secret since the world began. Well, those of you who have been rightly dividing for some time, you will know very well these two verses, and you need to commit them to memory and get a good grasp on them, because this is where we see a distinction. Peter is teaching the prophecy program concerning the kingdom. In Acts 3.21, he writes, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Paul speaks of the mystery, the grace program, in Romans 16.25, and he says, now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel, that's significant, because Paul is bringing a specific gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. Okay, you have a look at those two readings and you can see immediately there's a complete difference and distinction between things that were known and prophesied about since the world began versus things that were kept secret and only later revealed by the Lord Jesus directly to Paul the Apostle. And given that commission, as Paul says, he received it not of man, he received it directly from the Lord Jesus to share the secret plan that God had to save the Gentiles in spite of Israel, who had then rejected and crucified the Messiah. Anyway, that's all covered in previous lessons. Now, this is the reason Paul writes Romans chapter 9, 10 and 11, because he has to explain how God set Israel aside because of their unbelief. He explains that they stumbled at the cross, then there was a diminishing, and eventually they fell when they rejected Stephen's final offer for the kingdom that's in Acts 7. It's after that that we hear God calls Paul the apostle, and God now postpones the program with Israel, the prophecy program, and inserts a program, the grace program, which will incorporate involve the body of Christ in the timeline. Paul makes very clear that God will not abandon Israel nor his covenants and his promises to her concerning land, her kingdom, her priesthood role, etc. Multitude of beautiful promises and covenants that he made with them, which we've read in the Old Testament. He will, in the future ages to come, begin to work and restore faithful Israel as a blessing to the nations that takes place after the rapture of the body of Christ. If we mix up the programs, we end up with a myriad of teachings which do not answer any questions. They result in confusion and uncertainty and great doctrinal error in understanding the Bible. Many things are then spiritualized in order to try and make them make sense or fit. We call that spiritual lies because they are not taking the word of God literally. 
Thus, much of the Bible is rejected or distorted, and such doctrines like the rapture, the literal thousand-year kingdom on earth, even hell, Adam and Eve, the fact of sin, are now called something else or interpreted as something else, instead of allowing the scripture literally to interpret itself. There are many um, titles and labels that are given uh, concerning different theological ideas. But the point is, we're not here for theological ideas. We are here for what is God saying? What does God's word declare? That's what we're interested in. So some of these teachings are called amillennialism, which means there is no thousand years um, or kingdom on earth. Otherwise, the implication is also that we are living in that kingdom right now. There's also Calvinism, which distorts the doctrine of God, choosing and electing certain people, etc. But that's a subject for another study. Just remember this, right from the beginning of Abraham, the first time we hear about Abraham, the covenant made with Abraham were clearly given to the nation that God was creating and bringing about from faithful Abraham. And this was also to protect the integrity of the seed line, which we read about in Genesis 3.15. In Genesis 12.2, God said that Abraham would be a great nation, not nations. As we continue reading, we know that the nation is called Israel. It's given a specific piece of land with detailed boundaries in the Middle East. You'll see the map of that in previous lessons. The land detailed in position and size to become the place where God, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus, will set up the golden city of Jerusalem, the throne of David, using Israel as his priesthood nation to go to the rest of the nations and to bless the world. God said Israel would not be reckoned among the nations in Numbers 23 verse 9. The fact that Israel and the Jewish people still exist today is very significant. Israel has not been replaced. However, we know that they are now in the dispensation of grace on the same level ground with Gentiles. They have lost the advantage that they had before the Lord because of their rejection of the Lord Jesus. But they can still be saved today in this age. They need to believe in the Lord Jesus as their Savior to be saved by grace through faith just the same way as we are saved. So remember, the goal of prophecy has always been about the establishment of that kingdom on earth. There's no mention made of the body of Christ, the Christian, and its role in God's plans in the Old Testament or Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Only in Paul's writings do we find out about the mystery program for the body of Christ. Now, another point I want to bring up that adds to this confusion is not understanding the difference between the word testament and covenant. So there is an idea that the Gentiles are recipients of the benefits of the covenants of Israel. This is complicated by the fact that most modern version Bibles use the word covenant instead of testament and use the words interchangeably. So when you are reading a modern Bible version, such as the New King James, the NIV, etc., when Paul writes New Testament, they've changed it and the reader will read New Covenant. So obviously, they're going to conclude that Christians are under the covenants given to Israel. I did a quick check on this uh, using Bible Gateway, and out of 58 English Bibles, only about nine use Testament. All the others have changed the word Testament to Covenant. Remember, covenants were given to Israel. Only the King James Bible and those Bibles that are taken from the Textus Receptus text renders the correct words in Paul's writings. Paul never uses the word covenant regarding the blessings or eternal inheritance for the body of Christ. The only time Paul uses the word covenant in his epistles, that's Romans through to Philemon, is in the context and the reference to Israel and the prophecy program. Uh, by the way, Paul did not write the book of Hebrews. He uses the word testament. God never made covenants with the body of Christ. The spiritual blessings of the Christian are found in the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ alone by his grace through faith. So understand that a covenant can be broken, especially where man is involved, such as a marriage or a business agreement can fail. But a testament cannot be broken. It is all God and dependent on him. A testament depends solely upon the death of the testator, not the life or the works of the benefactors. So in Hebrews 9, 16 to 17, we read, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force, 
after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator lives. So understanding that is going to help you clarify that we are not part of the covenants. We therefore are not spiritual Israel and we do not replace the position that Israel has. So before we conclude today, I just want to mention that the application of the words covenant and testament is very interesting, but it will make up another study because it's quite involved. But I hope that I've given you enough to realize there is a big difference there. Um, with regard to the King James Bible, I want to just mention the detail here is found in a study of manuscript evidence. So when we talk about the King James Bible for English speaking people, we're talking about a Bible that comes from the Textus Receptus text, which is known as the majority text and was translated into English in 1611. It's really important to, to get this point and it's well worth uh, looking into the study of the King James so that you know with confidence that you hold the accurate, trustworthy word of God in your hand and that no words have been changed, etc. Now, I just want to mention, we talk about a text. It's not a translation and it's not a language. It's the text in which it was written. So if you want to have the text from God, you would surely go to Antioch where the beginning of the body of Christ started. The other texts, all the modern versions, are taken from what we call the minority text. It's shorter. If, if you look at the New King James Bible and the NIV, there's up to 100,000 word changes, which words have been changed. Uh, verses, 200 verses have been taken out. And um, that's a significant difference. And that's why that's called the minority text. But what is significant is that those, that text comes from Alexandria at the university in Egypt. So if you're looking for God's truth, you're hardly going to go to Egypt for it. But I just want you to know that it's a very valuable study and it's very important information. And it, it would be good for you to look into that and then you make up your mind. Remember, we are helpers of your joy. We have no dominion over your faith. So you have to examine and come to a conclusion of what you know and believe is truth, but you need the information. So in other words, make an informed choice about these matters. And that's why we study, so that we can find the exact truth and that which is solid and true before the Lord. And when you take out words of the Bible, it's going to affect the doctrine. It's going to affect the, what God intended for us to understand. So it is an, an important matter. I do have some notes on the subject, so if you're interested, let me know. Otherwise, I can also recommend some wonderful grace resources of really solid, good grace teachers that I can link you with, and you can do your further, your own study, and that you can come to a conclusion. Anyway, time is running on. Thank you for joining. May the Lord really bless and encourage you in your life, and go read your scriptures. Until we meet again, blessings to you. Bye for now. Thank mm -hmm. you.